Welcome to the DRF Sports Podcast, brought to you by DRF Sports. America's most trusted name in horse racing is now providing sports bettors with exclusive data, analytics, previews, videos, and expert picks on all major sports. Bet smarter and have more fun doing it. It's the DRF Sports Podcast, and now your host, Sheldon Alexander. Ready, set, bet. This is the DRS Sports Podcast, episode 47. Make sure you like and follow wherever you get your podcast. I'm your host, Sheldon Alexander. And boy, do we have something special for you coming up on this episode. The Winter Olympics are here. So we got some special guests coming through to hit you up with the betting angles you need to know heading in to all the events. I know we don't normally pay attention to a lot of these things, but that just means that there's value. And what we provide to you here, we try to bring you some experts to let you know what you need to be betting on. So might be a face that you're familiar with, might be a brand new face of the pod, but more on that in a sec. First, be a pro and win with DRF Sports Pro, introducing DRF Sports all new premium data feature on drf.com slash sports for $99 a year, which is just $8.25 a month. You can get industry-leading betting trends, angles, and analytics. With the playoffs here, it's the best way for you to make some money this postseason and have fun while doing it. DRF Sports Pro. Sign up now at drf.com slash sports. And as always, we try to keep up with the pro picks here as well on the pod. We do this normally twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, but every once in a while, we bless you with a special extra episode. And that's what we're doing today. So on the other side, you're going to hear from a very familiar face, as well as someone else that is completely locked into these Winter Olympic Games, which get started on Friday. We've got you covered. No other place you need to go to get all the best bets angles on the winter olympics what more do you want lucky for you it starts about now well it's a very special episode of the drf sports podcast as the winter olympics begin on friday with the opening ceremonies in beijing and then it's two weeks of caring about sports you would never otherwise even think about or maybe even care about but That provides value for us. And we like that here. And that's what we do. So as always, my name is Sheldon Alexander. I'm joined with our usual guest sports betting analyst, Mr. Matt Russell. Matt, how you doing, man? Uh, Listen, I feel like I should have, you know, like a rich brown leather chair, a fire roaring beside (laughs) me, you know, just to get into the feel for the Winter Olympics, right? Like just there should be (laughs) snow covered mountains outside. Like I need to get more into the vibe here. So hopefully bring in a guy sitting in California will help us do that. And it is definitely a vibe as this is a big welcome. First timer to the DRF Sports Podcast. He's known as the Whale Capper. You can catch him on NBC's Bet the Edge podcast, the Deep Dive podcast. Drew Dinsick, welcome to the show. How are you doing, my dude? Oh, I'm doing terrifically well. I absolutely love the uh, the two week extravaganza that is the Olympics. Usually, we get it every two years, but because of the delayed Summer Olympics, we get uh, a second uh, a second dose of the Olympic betting action here in the last six months. So, uh, very excited for the upcoming games. Winter Olympics, obviously, not quite as much in play in terms of uh, you know challenge in, in the handicapping space. I think we had something like. 400 gold medals or something crazy in the summer olympics there's 109 uh available here for the summer olympics so a little bit uh a little bit lighter load in terms of trying to come up with what you think reasonable projections are so it's uh that's made me made made me uh, uh breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief here Yeah, Drew was on my old podcast, The Window, and one of the last episodes that I did before sort of moving on to the score was a Summer Olympics preview with Drew, and it was uh, tons of good information, all of that sort of thing. But Drew, you're a swimmer by trade, if you will, and I'm not sure when the water freezes up and it turns to snow and ice, if you got the same magic that you had for that Summer Olympic preview that we did quite well on. So I'm expecting expecting some big things here, but I am a little uh, trepidatious here. As a a Canadian, and, you know, and you being like, as I mentioned, sitting in, in Southern California, I don't know if you're going to be able to adjust here to the winter winter events. 
Well, uh, it is true. I, you know, having a background in swimming, uh, obviously that helped gave me a little bit of a leg up in, in that particular yeah. avenue of, of handicapping match, you know, uh, you know uh, individual gold medals for sure. Um, but I care a lot about skiing as well, alpine skiing in particular. So uh, I watch I watch a lot of World Cup independent of betting on it. Uh, and okay. I, I have some pretty decent familiarity with all these skiers and 11 of our medals will be awarded in alpine skiing. So uh, looking to try to grind an edge there for sure. Nice. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, so the board isn't really as extensive as the Summer Olympics, as you already mentioned, Drew, but I, I have a question for you. Is it easier to handicap now that, you know, we're digging into some of these events that you don't really follow for three and a half years? Like, does that make it easier or harder? Like, what's your angle here? Yeah, it uh, it's not uh, it's yeah, it's not uh, especially easy to drop in and um figure out on the fly, like who's good at biathlon. <laughs> like <laughs> I haven't thought about the biathlon in four years, period. Uh, and realistically I came into the last year's uh, winter Olympics was the first year I hit pretty hard in terms of trying to handicap some of the metal props. And I remember thinking very, you know, I, I did like sort of a cursory, Oh, well, what are each, what is each country good at? Well, do they have anyone kind of at the top of the market in some of these sports and, you know, just sort of an ad hoc, like uh, let's put together sort of some back of the envelope metal projections. And I was coming up with like three or four for France and France's total was like five and a half. And I remember being like, well, that's crazy. This is a terrible line. There's no way they're getting six. This is ridiculous. Uh, and then the first day of the Olympics, France picked up two biathlon gold medals. And I was like, <laughs> well, <laughs> this is going to be a sweat. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, it came down to, uh, you know, a pretty, uh, a, a pretty wild uh, wardrobe malfunction for the French ice dancing team that really gave the, uh, the Canadian team the leg up on the short program uh, that ultimately clinched that French under for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so, <laughs> but you know, that, that experience was like, okay, you can't just hand wave this. You actually have to kind of look pretty hard at each of the uh, disciplines and really try to come up with what you think a fair projection is. And uh, you know, it's, it was, it's not surprise. It's, you know, you, it sounds crazy because there's 209, um, uh, oh, sorry, 109 gold medals that will be awarded. Um, but it only took me yeah, about four or five hours really to go through each sport and come up with what I thought was a reasonable distribution of how the gold medals would be awarded. Uh, and most of my, um, you know, most of my research, most of my input is coming from sort of a blend of three things. There are really three key areas you can use uh, to handicap Olympics. The first is obviously the market itself. Um, you know, if you can find a market making book that has odds available with reasonable limits on who will win any given gold medal, um, you know, you'll see that there are a handful of events out of the 109 where it's like, no, we know who's going to win. Like it would be a shock if this person, you know, uh, you know, the, the good example, like long track speed skating in the distance events, there is a Swedish uh, skater who is like, you know, he's, he's winning world cup events by like multiple seconds, you know, like he's almost certainly going to set two world records in the 5k, 10k and the market makes him like a minus 500 minus a thousand favorite to win those two events. And so, you got two Swedish golds right there with pretty high confidence. And so you can kind of use the market information that way and come up with expected uh, gold medals that are going to kind of be high probability events. And then you can take a look at, uh, you know, world cup rankings and standings are super a uh, good way to evaluate the current form of the athletes. Um, the uh, you know, that's something that is available basically for every one of these winter sports. FIS does basically everything on skis, you can go and look at the current standings of, uh, you know, all of the World Cup events in basically every single discipline. Um, so I cruise through all of those and just take a look at like, hey, is there anyone who is like at the top of the standings just utterly dominating, uh, you know, their discipline, like in this calendar year, 2021, 2022 season. Um, and then, you know, kind of, you know, if, if there's one clear dominant performer and two kind of decent performers, I'll split them up and say, okay, well, we'll give 50% probability that the dominant player wins that, 
uh, you know, wins that gold and 30% and 20% to the second and third, you know, so something like that, or split at 25, 25, 25, if there are four competitors who are all kind of, in, you know, trading gold medals over the balance of, the, of a given season. And that's, that's more kind of applicable to the Alpine skiing, for instance, where there's, tw- you know, quite a lot of uncertainty, quite a lot of turnover, no two World Cup events in a row, are you really going to have the same uh, gold medals across all the various disciplines. And even to make things more interesting, at, at this particular uh, Alpine skiing for this year's Olympics, it's a totally new course for all of these competitors. Uh, no one has ever seen it. No one has ever skied it. It will be a surprise. Uh, and that is unusual because there is almost all there, there are typically uh, test events. Uh, you know, there'll be a couple of World Cup events that happen at the course as you get closer to the Olympic competition. So at least everybody who's of world class kind of gets a chance to, to ski at once. Um, but because of the COVID rules in China, no one's really ever competed on this course before. So it'll be a, a, a very interesting and wide open Alpine skiing. Um, and then I guess the third thing that's pretty important from a handicapping standpoint, at least is looking at last year's world championships and then last Olympics, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, who did well in last Olympic cycle. There's a, uh, there's a general, um, you know, uh, excellence in terms of kind of certain countries programs for certain Olympic sports that I think is an important signal. Um, like even if you look at like the current standings in say, uh, you know, luge or bobsled or something like that. And you're like, well, there's not as many German, uh, you know, sledders that I was, as I would have expected here. Don't let that fool you. Germany will absolutely dominate those events. Like they're really uh, good at timing it right, right? Like, be, well, like yeah, well, at the yeah, right and, time. yeah, exactly. They're peaking at the right time on top mm-hmm. of the fact that, yeah, in an Olympic year, they're not necessarily taking the, the uh, kind of the warm up events as seriously, uh, you know, because it's like, no, what we care about, you know, th- there's no prize money in it, there's no glory in it. The Olympics are coming up. Like, we're going to absolutely make sure that our best equipment is available and our guys are in top form for that day as opposed to you know really kind of pressing hard to win you know world cup event number three in salt lake city in the middle of december right you know so so there are there is for sure in my opinion like some programs that just absolutely excel in given disciplines that you have to sort of have respect for um and uh and so even if the world the current world standings the current world rankings wouldn't tell you um that there is someone of note uh, I still kind of give them a decent chance. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, this, this is, I, I bring up the German sledders is a good example. The Austrian uh, Alpine skiers is a great example. Um, the uh, Norwegian cross country skiers is yeah. a great example. Uh, Russian figure skaters is a good example. United <laughs> States snowboarding team in general overperforms the Dutch long track speed skaters, the Cur- South Korean short track speed skaters. Those are sort of the, uh, you know, don't look past. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Everybody has their own department in the winter Olympics. Exactly. Right. Like that's, everybody's that's, got their yes. own sort of specialty. Yeah. Yeah. We are like, Oh, listen, if you're trying to, if you're trying to uh, speed skate, don't mess with the, w- with the Dutch. But if we're moving it over onto the snow for cross country, the Dutch have no chance because the Norwegians have been working on this the entire time. Right. And it's like, that's exactly. in a way that's kind of fun because it isn't just, you know, apologies, you know, to, to you guys down there. It's not just the Americans winning everything. Like sometimes it's, cer- it's certainly not this year. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, year. we'll talk about that. Um, you mentioned, you know, sort of Norway here and you look around the market and I know sort of metal count is a big thing for you. Your, your big bet on the metal count this past summer was Japan. And that was maybe more of a squeaker than you thought it was going to be. But that was kind of the point that you could be, you know, a little bit off and still end up, <laughs> you know, potentially winning. Uh, so, you know, f- sort of a three part question here and you can take it as, uh, you know, as little or as long as you want here. So do you have a a big metal count bet that you like a ton? I'm looking at this market, sort of question number two here, and I'm going, man, like Norway is going to take all of these medals in these, you know, in every uh, discipline of cross-country skiing. And it looks like they're minus 400, minus 500 to have the most golds. And I don't know, I'm novice to all of this sort of, you know, in a way, but I look at that and I go, 
man, if you have the ability to win gold and silver, you know, from your country in those events, like one of those two people are going to win it. And so it looks like to me, this is a two week event. I could put some money in on Norway to have the most golds at about 22% rate of return on my investment for two weeks from now. Why wouldn't I do that? So I guess the question to you, Drew, is why wouldn't I do that? And then the third <laughs> question that you can take is Team USA. I get the impression you're going under on Team USA. So uh, as as you see fit there, my friend. Yeah, the Team USA one is an, is, is an easy under, in my opinion. That, that one's a, a pretty solid bet. But um, I'm going a little against the grain, a little against the market here in Norway. And there's a Whoa. couple reasons why. Um, now, most of my, okay, I guess a couple, a couple kind of key things to think about here. There was there was a lot of liquidity available in the metal markets in the summer for reasons unknown. Like there was a lot of people were willing to take bets on that. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, it is like pulling teeth trying to get people to write bets for the metal markets in the Winter Olympics. I think maybe potentially the cross, timing crossover with the Super Bowl and there's basketball going on. Like there's just, there may be just, there's enough action. They're writing enough handle that they're like, you know what? we get, we get beat every time we, we do Olympics anyway. Like this is, this is more of a courtesy to our players. Uh, we don't really feel like at this time, like that's sort of the spirit that I get as I'm trying to right. track down these markets. But like, you know, you could get 40 different countries for the summer Olympics, they had a metal market on them. And so, you know, it was a, it was a, yeah. a, a very fun and worthwhile experience trying to project those medals. And you brought up the Japan under as sort of the, the one that I sweated the hardest because it was, you know, it was like under 27 and a half. And I was basically like, for them to get this, like every single thing has to break right for them. And in the end, like it pretty much did. <laughs> and it's, they landed at 27. So I got it yeah. by a half and it came down to the very last event of the Olympics, which was the women's Omnium in cycling, yeah. which I had never heard of before in my life. They, and it's an Japan insane event insane where rules event. are changing yeah. halfway through the event. Yeah. And, yeah. and <laughs> Japan had the favorite. She ended up getting silver <laughs> 25 yeah. to one long shot from the United States, still gold there and kept, uh, kept Japan that. under their, with their gold medal total. It was absolutely ridiculous. The similar feel about this Norwegian total right now, I caught a little under 19 and a half, um, which I think is a very, very, very favorable uh, projection for them to get to, for them to get 20. Again, we only have 110, 909 medals to go, go around. So for them to get to 20, they got to win basically almost a fifth of these yeah. events, which is a lot. Yeah, and they got to get their specialties and other people's specialties. Right? You said it exactly correctly, right? Um, they they have to not sweep the cross country in the biathlon, but they have to basically dominate cross country and biathlon. Catch a couple alpine skiing golds. Catch a couple, um, you know, catch a couple of, of speed skating golds. And I'm just not there with this team in general. Um, my projection for them is actually. Uh, only uh only 15 gold medals um so i'm a decent chunk under their expectation of 19 and a half here and again like if you want to break down some of the other aspects of norway in particular it's a fragile expectation for them because they are counting on a couple of athletes to really crush mm. right like uh you bring up like the cross-country skiing uh is a great event for norway 100% agreed. There are 13 gold medals to be awarded in cross-country skiing. But uh, if you look at the current odds, they're basically counting on a 31, sorry, a 33-year-old athlete um, on the women's side to win a pretty, to win four golds, right? <laughs> and she is, to this point in her career, only ever won one Olympic medal period. And it was in 2014. Oh, wow. So, she did well in last year's world championships. Yes, she's done fine in this year's run up to the event. Um, but if she has an off event right there and she takes one gold, two silvers and a bronze, then he, she is one, not four. Right. And so there's a swing of three just on that alone. And that's kind of the way that a lot of these events tend to go is there's a little bit of there's less dominance, really. Yeah in the winter Olympics, in my opinion, than what you have in the summer Olympics, summer Olympics, if you have, uh, like a, uh, uh, if you have like a swimmer having the meat of their life, 
there's not a lot of difference between the hundred fly and the two fly. Plus they're on two relays, you know? Yeah. And, and so it's not, it's not exactly the same when it comes to cross country skiing. And I could be, you know, I could be wrong. And you know, this, this gal could have <laughs> again, the, the Olympics of her life and, and win four gold medals. But um, you know, I currently, I think she's 50, you know, f- between 40 and 60% for the best events that she's competing in. Um, and she okay. really would need to get them all to, to, to get that, uh, uh, that sweep and keep them in play for 20. Um, and then really that goes for a couple of their other athletes as well. Like in the men's Nordic combined, they're counting on two, uh, from the same athlete in the bi- biathlon, they're counting on three from the same athlete, uh, Alpine skiing, they're counting on two from the same athlete on the men's side. So, you know, there's, there's a decent, uh, there's a decent fragility really when it comes to Norway's expectation that I think you can prey on. Um, and this is actually entirely setting aside the point that a lot of Norway's success in cross country skiing recently, especially, I don't know why my cat dying to be on this call, but <laughs> huge, not, huge, huge, Olympics fan. huge, huge, you can Olympics. do a four way pod. It's okay. A four way <laughs> pod. Get another box. Um, we need another box. But yeah, another box for the cat. The last kind of final point here: a lot of the success that Norway's had, particularly in the cross country skiing and biathlon, has been while the Russian athletes were suspended from competition, and they're not this time. I was going to so, make that point. I was going to yeah. ask because you know when we're talking about a, a cross you know, cross country skiing biathlon. You know, I don't, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, the, uh, <laughs> maybe the drugs help everyone, <laughs> but I got to tell you that event feels like one where if you just really wanted a gold medal that badly, you know, you could really become superhuman for a couple of months and yeah. buy yourself one sort of at the expense of maybe a couple of years at the end of your life, potentially. Yeah. Right. And that I mean, obviously makes things a little dicier for Norway. And we know that happened in 2014 in Sochi. Yeah. But, and and here's the other thing if they get busted the bet has already been paid out yeah right right exactly. so no well, yeah we'll hear about over. it in 2024 there'll <laughs> be some right. news dump on a friday oh by yeah. the way russia was uh had eight olympic athletes that were suspended and stripped of their gold medals. <laughs> yeah and i'll <laughs> so be like, deep oh, into wow. my account Jeez. you know going, <laughs> wow, i've okay. got the i have the confirmation <laughs> yeah. number from this from three years ago can i <laughs> like, wow, can i get that paid out now and i would get laughed at in that circumstance <laughs> so okay so it, yes, that yes, means there's 15 gold medals you know, you sort of say, okay, that's the number. Sure. What's the number that you expect to take the most golds, right? If you sort of shift yeah. things around, if you're telling me you're jumping in front of the train, that is me looking to do this 20% investment prog- program here, sure, which I, sure. I gather that's the feeling, right? That you're looking at this going sure. like minus 500 is too high of a price to pay for Norway. I'm not going to ask you unless you sort of have a play for most golds, but what's the number of golds that we should be expecting here to yeah. take this home? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I did, I did make a play. It was, it was, a, it's a price that sadly is difficult. Actually, I take that back. You probably can still find this, but the, there's like Russia 10 to ones out there still. And again, this kind of yep. goes to our, what we were just talking about. Um, <laughs> if they overperform, if they overperform <laughs> in cross country skiing, not only is their yeah. count going up, but they're taking them away from Norway. Right. Yeah. So this is, yeah. so this, it's, it's a, uh, it's a two edged sword there. Um, and 10 to one for Russia uh, versus, uh, you know, minus 500 for Norway is, is plus EV in my book. I'm expecting mm-hmm. Russia to get 11. And that is if they only pull three cross country skiing, I'm expecting Norway to get 15, but that is if they pull seven cross country. And so if you flip two, all of a sudden now we're tied. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and realistically, I think it's going to take at least 13 to win most golds. Um, and you know, I think there's not a lot of Russian athletes that I would say are quote unquote solid gold, <laughs> like, like, yeah. Ooh, yeah, no, ooh, we're in great shape here. Don't worry. Don't, you don't need to watch that event. You don't need to watch that event. We got them. Um, they really only have two figure skatings where I would say they're, all, you know, better than 80% chance to get a gold medal. So Russia could underperform. Surely okay. they could come up with five ultimately, you know, sure. ultimately, and or they can get you know athletes suspended in you know in the course of the Olympics, at which point they get you know disqualified and stuff. So you know there <laughs> there certainly are there are holes in this strategy. Don't get me wrong, but uh, Russia at, a, a, at eleven golds is one of these that I think is high variance, right? Yeah, like mm-hmm. it's eleven. 
it could be 15 yeah. it could be five, five. right yeah uh-huh. and um and like let's talk about like the one other team you know the one other country that has a chance is germany and yeah. germany is i'm at 11 also for my projection but it's like 11 that you can write in pen mm. like, there's not a lot of upside where things break right for them. And there's not a lot of events where I see other teams reasonably chipping away at their total. Right. Um, so that one's like, a, it's like, you know, that one's a narrow distribution. They're going to be like, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12. If you could put, yeah. if you could put Germany in a, <laughs> in a gold medal teaser, you absolutely yes. would do it. Oh you my god! If you could tease, if you could tease Germany down four goals. That's a <laughs> that's, that's a that's an outstanding team. Or up, like, yeah. or, or up four goals. Up or up four right. goals. They're not going. <laughs> they're not going. They're not going above fourteen. They're not going below. Uh, they're not. I think their total is right around 10, 10 and a half. So they're not. Yeah, they're not going over fourteen and a half. They're not going under six and a half. No way. Unfortunately, that's not a thing. But. So, Drew, you mentioned <laughs> Team USA. You mentioned not Team yet. USA, and I've got, it piqued my interest though. Sure just where you're going with team USA and why, like, can you elaborate a little on, on kind of where, why you're down on team USA? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, this isn't even really part of the angle so much, but I think it's worth kind of reflecting on what's been going on with the U S Olympic program uh, in the last four years, not just the winter Olympic program, but the summer Olympic program that the pandemic wildly disrupted things. Um, in terms of just sort of the, the normal um, progression of an elite athlete from a collegiate experience to a semi-pro to a pro at, at an Olympic level type of experience. And we underperformed in Tokyo to a degree that was eye-opening. <laughs> like, what the heck happened, guys? It was a really, really bad Olympics for us. And it wasn't even one sport. It was across all the sports. Um, and so I think that may be playing a little bit into this because as I looked kind of doing the kind of, again, kind of looking at markets, particularly trying to find high likelihood U S gold medals, they're just not there this year. Um, Mm. the, you know, the big brand name excellence, you know, excellent athletes, uh, the Michaela Schifrin's, the Chloe Kim's, the Sean White's, all of those athletes have questions swirling about their form. Um, Sean White is not even really likely to be much of a factor, I wouldn't say at all. Um, well, it's 63 but, uh, yeah. years old. Why would Sean White be? <laughs> <laughs> Why would Sean White be? Like, how is, how is somebody, I mean, I don't know exactly how old he is. I'm sure he's probably like somehow 32 or something like that because he was probably winning gold medals at 15. But like half pipe is not an event that you want to mess around with right no no that's right (laughs) how is he still in like there's gotta he's gotta have something else to do i guess maybe yeah yeah no it's uh, (laughs) but you know so in general the united states picks off a couple of alpine skiing golds we pick off um you know one two figure skating golds uh maybe we're in play for a nice hockey gold um, we get some good freestyle skiers, we get some good snowboarders and, uh, you know, we potentially sneak a, a speed skating gold, right? Like that's usually, uh, how our, you know, our compilation goes. We're not mm-hmm. like some of these other countries that have one event where we can really flex like snowboarding yeah. is sort of the, maybe the one where we have historically done so well, but again, like we invented snowboarding for crying out loud. Right. So if we're not World is catching event, up. then what are we doing? <laughs> um, but I'm only, I'm only projecting the United States to get one snowboarding goal this year. So we're in a little bit of trouble. 1.1. And that's, I think the Chloe Kim plus one other uh, fella, um, you know, who's, who's got uh, a decent chance there. So it's going to be a tough ask for us to get anywhere close to what the expectation is. This number has come down. I saw it open at like 10 and a half ish around Christmas. They weren't taking big bets. Got, there was juicy 10 and a half to the under it got back to nine and a half. Now it's at eight and a half. Some of this is some athletes uh, have gotten hurt and pulled out who had reasonable realistic chances. Some of it's people just kind of doing the math and realizing like, Holy smokes, like where are the golds going to even come from? Um, if we get one in alpine skiing from Michaela Schifrin, that'll be a win. Mm. If we get one in figure skating from Nathan Chen, the uh, current market leader for the men's figure skating, that'll be a win. Um, we can come back and talk a little bit more about that particular 
uh, event because I have another bet on that one. But, um, you know, that the, the women's uh, ice hockey uh, is 50-50 with Canada. That would be a win. Um, I've got us for a couple of freestyle skiing uh, as high likelihood and then one snowboarding and one speed skating for a total of seven and a half uh, projected golds here. So still some ed- edge now that the market is down to eight and a half. Uh, I think again, um, you know, that's you know, things that kind of have to break right for us, uh, mm. to hit that number. So I think, uh, I think it's going to be a tough one. And honestly, what's, you know, else is funny. There is a breakout athlete in this Olympics in the freestyle skiing who was born in the United States, who has the potential to win three golds. She could win big air. She could win half pipe. She could win slope style. She is competing for China, not for the United States. And it is a wild uh, scandal that I think, uh, wow. I mean, not a scandal, obviously, but like right. a wild, what the heck is going on here kind of a moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, potentially she'll make quite a lot of money and she advertises a lot of luxury brands on behalf of, uh, yeah. you know, multinational corporations. And so, you know, maybe um, it's a business decision. It was a business a, decision. A it was a, a business one. decision. That's exactly correct. It was a like Sean White decision. doing the half pipe into his fifties. It's a business. I, you decision. know, it's that's, that is too. He's trying to, yeah, I got to inject my brand into China. I got to, you know, get that, that last, uh, last little parachute money here. Um, Eileen Gu is, uh, the athlete, 18 year old, uh, freestyle skier, um, who could potentially win three golds for China, not for the United States. Okay. Cool. I feel, I feel as a Canadian, I know Matt is a Canadian. I feel like I got to ask you about sure. Canada and the medal numbers and I'll full on admit my bias and wanting to know the answer to these questions. Cause Hey, there might be some events that I'll be watching and might make it a little more interesting to sprinkle a little while I'm rocking my Canadian flag. So I let me indulge for a couple questions here, but Canada used to, you know, be able to score in figure skating, but there's some optimism now, right? Some of that maybe comes from speed skating. Mm-hmm. Where do you kind yeah, of see the shift. value or maybe the better angles for the Canadian contingent? If I were to be looking, you know, some place where I could also win some money while cheering for gold. Okay. Great medals, faster, essentially. Skating. Great questions. <laughs> uh, I'll give you sort of the, 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 um, the events that Canada has the highest likelihood here. I like it. Um, I like it. In speed skating. They have a, uh, there is a very fast skater for the men's 500 on the long track. Uh, so the men's 500 is the shortest event uh, on the okay. long, that's contested on long, basically a dead sprint. Um, okay. And uh, I give them about a 50% chance to win gold in the men's 500 on the long track. Uh, on okay. the short track speed skating, um, let me f- jump up to and roller that. derby as we like to call it. Yeah. yeah I have yeah, a, I was say. <laughs> yeah, I have an expected medal hall for Canada of uh, one and a half golds in short track. Uh, the women's okay. 500, they've got a decent shot. The women's 1500, they've got a decent shot. The men's 1000, they have a decent shot And the men's 5,000 relay. They have a decent shot. So short track is pretty competitive, um, but I'm distributing the golds. there pretty much equally between Canada and, uh, Netherlands and South Korea, uh, more or less. Okay. And so, um, so like short track really- speed, short track speed skating is the peak of Canadian sport because we're really, really good at it. We end up getting pushed into the wall by some illegal tactic and then we're too nice <laughs> to complain about it, but we all just whine to each other North of the border about how we got robbed in that short track speed skating. Like it is sneaky <laughs> and important event for Canadians just because of the physicality. Like it's like hockey only without the stick or the puck and yeah. there's no penalties being called. And it feels like we're always getting on the wrong side of said penalty. But like we're all just like, well, get them next time, guys. And you know, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. The uh, the one other interesting one to watch for is a new one, uh, new event, uh, new event alert. Yeah. There are seven new events in this year's Olympics. One of them, I think, I make uh, Canada a decent chance to bring home gold, and it's in the bobsled, the women's okay. mono bob. Uh, Canada has a competitor. First ever. Hold on. You made that up. Com- you made nope. that up. That's not a real thing. <laughs> that is, is not real. a real thing. I do this not believe real. it. <laughs> Women's mono Bob uh, is, okay. uh, is going to be contested. Let me uh, pull up the name here, but uh, uh, basically market expects uh, she's you know, about a 50, 50 shot here with a, uh, a woman from, I believe uh, 
Austria is uh, is your okay. prime competition there. Um, and so, well, the there's model also model, can you... oh no, excuse me, U.S. There's a U.S. woman who's apparently good at the model. Sorry, you said so. that's a solo bobsleigh. It's a solo bobsleigh. The first yeah, they time, rejected... as far as I can tell you, first time <laughs> they, they rejected you know Bob. <laughs> they rejected <laughs> Unibob as, you know, yeah. as the answer. But Drew, <laughs> this is, and honestly, I, you know, fortunately, we're not going to come to blows, I don't think, over this sort of thing. But the American that you're referring to is Kaylee Humphreys. Ah, who yes, is that's correct. A legendary Canadian uh, bobsledder, a two time yes. gold medalist that that became a naturalized American a couple of years ago and in late stage in her career. And listen, you, and you talked about scandal as far as uh, the American that be, you know, became a you know, Chinese, essentially, this was actually a scandal in Canada and, you know, all sorts of, you know, nefarious accusations and that sort of thing. And yeah, and she's she's kind of a legend. You know, you win two gold. Listen, you win two gold medals in anything in Canada, you immediately become a legend. You do so in the Winter Olympics, you become a legend times two. And then things went south. And it's sort of you know, if you ever feel like you know you're sitting around watching the bobsled, Google Kaylee Humphreys and that story because it gets pretty deep. And so you know, we're sitting back and we don't you know listen, our radar isn't necessarily super locked in on on bobsled, and we find out that this again legend like literal flag bearer a couple of olympics ago yeah. yeah and 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 she's now she's now riding pushing slaying i don't really know the term uh sliding uh for the united <laughs> states and it's like oh and then you read the story and you kind of go oh okay kind of don't really blame her but she's sort of on the back end of her career and uh that's going to be interesting if you think that that's going to be a canada versus u.s type uh yeah. type battle to get down the uh, down the hill that in the is mono fascinating because the the canadian woman that i had tagged is cynthia apaya of mm -hmm. ontario and she was a teammate of kaylee humphreys uh yeah. on the farm uh, back in uh, the last olympic cycle so uh maybe yeah. a little uh little uh little bad blood there very very interesting yeah. let's let's right? get that into prime time Let's, you know, let's, uh, let's hey, we got to go to this live. I know I'll be tuned in now. Now that I know that this is a thing, the mono bob. I'm in. Yeah. The I'm mono bob. I mean, you know, the, the, the luge is a little, um, tough to really kind of wrap your head around that. That's like a sledding experience. Everyone has sledded in their life when they were kids. And you think yeah. of like a sled, like you're running and you jump on your sled and you go, but not like, yeah. not like feet first and in a, you know, in a, in a, in a suit like that, but the mono bob feels a little bit more approachable, a little more relatable. Sure. <laughs> well, they eventually looked and saw some kids on those, you know, those multi-tracked like ones where they're sitting up on the on the seat and it actually has a wheel and they're like you know we don't have a we don't have a winter olympic event that directly reflects that we have the two we have the four we have people going down head first now we have people lying on their back looking straight but we never had one where it was just one person driving the driving the train down the down the hill so mm. i'm glad that we got an extra <laughs> event it just would have been nice That's if fair. we had if we had the top two like, how great would that be for Canada? But then we went and we screwed it up and we lost one of the uh, our all-time best athletes. So that's uh, well, also if we're, we're going to stay here on the Canada angle here, Matt, I, I do have a question for you. If we're looking at sure. the Canadian events and, you know, there obviously would have been a Canadian versus American rivalry in hockey if the mm -hmm. NHLers were going to be there. That might have been very interesting. But even removing that, I want to ask you, better chance of Canada sweeping golds. Is it three curling events or the two hockey events? Oh, okay. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, th yeah, you <laughs> mentioned it, right? The Canada, the men's hockey situation is grim right now. You look at the roster, there's like three former NHLers, one that you would have possibly heard of, right? It's basically guys who couldn't make the NHL or, you know, again, uh, have been sort of booted out the bottom of the league. That's going to be a bit rough. Uh, I don't know that I'm looking to bet Russia in that circumstance. Uh, I would maybe end up doing it sort of pseudo betting on them if I'm going for the uh, for them for, to win all of the golds, if you will. 
I like Finland in that. I think Finland at plus 700 is a decent look. That's a team that always kind of shows up with lesser talent and sort of has that infrastructure sort of, you know, some of the parts type situation. And they always, you know, when they don't win, it's because they don't have the talent that Canada has, right? And then to a lesser extent, Russia and a lesser extent, the US, right? And so now that's sort of out of the equation. You get a bunch of KHL guys from Russia who in theory could be playing in the NHL in some cases and some just prefer to stay home. So uh, I'm looking at, you know, if we have a couple of plus 700s there, Canada and Finland, I would bet Finland before I would Canada. Now you go into the women's hockey and Drew mentioned that it's 50-50. This is the event. And Drew, I don't even know if there's a comp in the United States for this, where everybody takes four years for one single solitary event. And that is normally hockey in general, but certainly men's hockey. Like the debate that rages over who is going to be on the team 18 months ahead of time, who are our goalies going to be, right? Like you never really think about who can, which goaltenders in the NHL are Canadian until you realize we have an Olympics coming up. That void is entirely going to be taken by the women's hockey game like i don't know what happened to me somewhere along the lines but all i care about when it comes to the olympics is the women's events i don't know why it's the thing like when we won soccer it was like there should have been a national holiday i'm convinced of it all of that sort of thing <laughs> and so like yes it might be 50 50 for canada and the united states i just can't even wrap my head around the idea of canada not beating the United States and women's hockey. Again, I realized that minus 110 on either side is probably a fair price, but I will definitely be betting that. So I'm going to avoid that. On the curling side of things, Drew, I don't know if you ever sort of dive into these sort of um, analytic projections or whatever, but Nielsen Grace Note projected Ooh. zero gold medals for Canada in curling. That is the most offensive thing I have ever read on the internet, which is saying something given the last four to five years that we've had in our lifetimes. Zero gold medals. I think they win them all. I'm going wow. all gold medals, parlay them, put them together however you want. Here's the situation. Last time we sent Kevin Cooey in the, on the men's side. And this is a guy, listen, good curler. There's a lot of good curlers in Canada, right? To qualify for <laughs> curling, uh, the curling team, you have to, you know, you win a tournament. But as Drew mentioned, whether it's World Cups in skiing or some of these other events, right? It's kind of just one tournament and there are a ton of good players, et cetera, et cetera. We're sending legends this time around. We are Ooh. not screwing around. Brad Gushu, who won gold in 2006. He's 41 years old. He's back. Like this is a career guy who has been consistently awesome is a, you know, again, a curling legend in Canada of which let's be honest. There are a few, I, I will acknowledge, but on the women's <laughs> side, Jennifer Jones, we are going veterans this time around. We are, you know, this is last chance to dance situations here with Gushu and Jennifer Jones. I think in both cases, we get gold there as we normally do in this, in these events. And then of course you have your mixed, uh, your mixed curling for the second time. We won gold last time around. John Morris was the male in that mixed uh, event. And this time, Rachel Homan, who is right there with Jennifer Jones, as far as top level, sort of, again, quasi curling legend. I think that's going to be fine. The reason that Morris is not playing with the gold, his gold medal partner from four years ago is that she is on Jennifer Jones's team and Canada does not let you know, it's not a two for one situation in Canada. That's how many curlers we have where you're literally not allowed to participate in both. Right. So Morris can't be on the men's team or vice versa. Homan can't be on the women's team and vice versa. And so in this case, Morris had to look around and he said, hey, I need a I need a I need a female partner for this for this mixed event. How about I go with the sec or arguably the best, but second best women's curler on essentially the planet, right? With Jones winning that event over Homan, Homan goes, and here we are. I think we win them all. I'm seeing there, there are certain websites that maybe, you know, certain people don't necessarily have access to because they might be just north of the border. There's a bet that you can, <laughs> you can get 80 to one, 80 to one for all three golds. That's a prop wow. bet that exists, again, so in certain places uh, here up in Canada. And I imagine that's, you know, sort of taking some off of the top as far as uh, when you're creating a prop, right? It's probably not the purest number as far as parlaying all three of those together. But if you do and you can get more than 81, 80 to 1 or anything close to 80 to 1, absolutely do it. Because frankly, and Drew, again, maybe you don't understand, we were embarrassed 
by losing <laughs> curling last time around. And I don't know if that sort of has anything to do with like on the ice stuff, but we're talking about like there was an argument about who should go from the women's side because like things got kind of crazy as far as like qualifying and that sort of thing is concerned. Like there was like backroom debates about who should go. They ended up choosing the legend, Jennifer Jones. And so she's going. So curling across the board, wow. I'm a little worried about the men's hockey team and then women's hockey for my lungs, maybe not <laughs> from a financial standpoint, but for hey. not my lungs, my heart, my heart, different organ, different I, organ. Yeah. I like, I like Canada to the over. I like us to the under. So I'm essentially cheering for the Canadian women's hockey team to get the win. And um, it might come down. Your right. curling takes are very, very, very well informed. First of all, wow, um, that's debatable. But I, yeah. I'm impressed. Well, no, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that. I, I like all. I I did my homework on curling. Didn't catch any of that. Um, and, and I was honestly, I was kind of wondering and curious about some of the selections because you know the great Ken Palm of college yes. basketball fame runs a yeah. very oh, yeah. detailed curling analytics website, right. and you know the number okay. two kidney, you know the number two women's curler in the world, Tracy Fleury. Uh, was not on, you know, it was not selected for the women. She's, it's not, uh, and she wasn't selected as the woman on the mixed side. So I was like, Ooh, there must be a story here. Um, and then at the same time, uh, you know, your mixed team is going up against the second best men's curler in the world, uh, Scottish dude, uh, and paired with the third best women's curler in the world. Um, they look like a formidable pair. I feel like so, if, I feel like if you guys get stunted, it's because of that mixed doubles team, and it's the Great Britain, uh, the Great Britain pair may get you. Sure, I couldn't be less worried about mixed doubles. <laughs> I, would, I couldn't be less worried. Bruce, Listen, if there's Bruce, if there was Bruce <laughs> Muat doesn't mo out mo no. I have no idea how to pronounce his name. It's well, so here's the situation. <laughs> you want information, Drew, about curling? I'm here yeah. for it. Um, okay. Here's the situation, right? I don't know necessarily how 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 the illustrious Mr. Pomeroy does his analytics as far as that stuff's concerned, you know, or the rankings, right? Like I know, sure. you know, you look at golf rankings, for example, right? And it's like different system and the points are happening over on Europe. And you're like, that's a little bit sketchy because, you know, different competition, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. The best week to week curling is getting played in Canada in the grand slam of curling that got absolutely jammed up, right? We are still, we came out of lockdown two days ago, Drew, here in Ontario. Right. So things got jammed up as far as different sporting events. Right. There's still NHL games being played without fans. And I'm not saying that like fans in the curling stands is going to like make a massive difference. But like it's also a thing that exists at these events. These are very social events. Right. The big thing about a curling event is going to the after party, if you will. Right. And it's probably one of the more calm uh, and, and sort of well tempered after parties you've ever been to in your life. Uh, but the point is, is like there's a different deal when it's, you know, just curling happening in an empty arena. And maybe, you know, again, I don't know how they're sort of adding up all these points, but when all these events get canceled and, you know, obviously the different European and American players, they come and they play in these grand slam of curling events that happen in Canada and, you know, Northern United States, like when all all of that gets jammed up over the last couple of years. I don't know how much I'm going to trust the analytics and the rankings and okay. that sort of thing. And maybe that's why Canada went with literally like the Mount Rushmore of female curling. It's Jennifer Jones. It's Rachel Holman. It's the late Sandra Schmerler. Boom. You didn't think you'd get some Sandra Schmerler in your life today, but know. you did. And I, I don't know. I'll save that. I'll save a fourth spot for somebody that I'm not thinking of right now. Uh, and obviously John Morris has, you know, won a gold in the past and, and Homan, like I said, is right there in the, in the upper echelon, the, the Mount Rushmore or whatever the Canadian version of Mount Rushmore would be uh, for curling. So there's yeah, been, sweeping there, the board. I've seen, I've, seen the time of, of our lives. I've seen a lot of sharp action on the Swiss women. And I've seen a lot of sharp action on the Great Britain mixed. That's all I gotta say about that. <laughs> Listen, and I the like late your Canadian. I like your Canadian men gold, but I think there's gonna be a little bit of distribution here. Uh, I know, you know, and honestly, the Swiss women. The reason that there's sharp action on that is Ken Palm's fault. He has yeah. the number one women's curler in the world right now, Silvana Tiranzoni of Switzerland, mm -hmm. and she has a meaningful, uh, you know, meaningful rate current rating over the, the the aforementioned great Jennifer Jones. Well, and it's worth mentioning though, Drew. There's four members to a team, my friend. There's four members. That's to That's true. Team. That's true. And again, but like skip, I mentioned, but the skip is. She's Skip throwing is, last rocks. She's yeah. making the decisions. I get it. But again, like this isn't a physical event, right? Where you're, you know, 
smashing into different people and throwing them into, the, into no. the boards. It's There's uh, a lot of sweeping involved. It's a ton of sweeping, but Jennifer Jones doesn't have to I've do any of it. Blisters on my hands from sweep, sweeping. Listen, yeah, I, I refuse to curl because I hit, I hit my knee on the ice so often when I'm <laughs> when I'm the shooter that it's really a painful situation. Um, so yeah, like yes, it, it can there can be bruises, but they are a lot more smooth uh, than I am when it comes to that and this point that I'm making. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, Jennifer Jones, like literally the third on her team, I think she's the third, she might even be the second on the team is a literal gold medalist, right? So like, a, yeah. I, I would sort of say like, congratulations on the ranking points and that sort of thing. But like, we're talking about, you know, when we're going to get down to it, semifinals and finals, right? Being able to execute a shot in a, in a you know, sort of a, what's the word I want to, uh, uh, you know, something that has to be very sort of specific, right? Like you have to make that shot in a pressure situation. Like, give me the... Give me the veterans in all of this, right? Give me the people who are, are tried and true and not just showing up on the uh, on yep. the ranking system. Yeah, that was way too much. Clutch shots. No, no, that was fascinating. No, I'm, I, I, if don't get me wrong, um, I do a lot of Olympic content, um, and uh, people always ask about curling, and I'm always like, uh, I mean, I know I don't bet into it because the markets are too sharp. That's kind of my default answer. I now I have some more, more, uh, more, more powder there, so I appreciate it. Yeah. We just did a deep dive in the clutch curling shots, not where, That's right. you know, combining, where was my day going to take me? I wasn't really sure, <laughs> but clutch curling shots. I'm here for yeah. it. I'm here for it. Drew, I want to get you out of here on this though. Is yeah. there going to be one event that you'll be hinging your hopes on? I, I remember you, yes. you mentioned earlier on and you guys talked about it in the summer on Matt's pod about sweating out ice dancing. So is there anything late in the schedule that you see being the key to your Olympics betting this time around? Yeah, I'm. There's one bet that I've made now, multiple places limit bet that's gonna make or break. Uh, not not break, but make in a big way uh, if it hits. And it is the men's figure figure skating gold. Okay. Um, and this is actually gonna be one of the more interesting, one of the more interesting kind of prime time events. Anyway, like there'll be a lot of interest in this because it's a really high. You know, it's very competitive. Um, uh, field overall uh there is a two-time champion uh two-time gold medalist uh for the men's figure skating whose name is yuzuru hanyu he is 27 years old he is from sendai japan he is very artistic he is very very beautiful to watch figure skate and he is extremely talented jumper on top of that uh and he won the 2018 gold in pyeongchang going away like it, you watched him skate the long program and you were like, this guy's in his class by himself. Like there's no doubt. And that was his second gold medal. Right. And there was a, there was a depressed price on him that last, last time too. We got involved at about plus plus one fifty ish because there was a ton of concern heading into the event. He had hurt his ankle. Is he fit? Is he going to go like in qualifying? He had a nasty ankle. Uh, you know, his, you saw, uh, you watched the replay on YouTube and you're like, Oh, how is this guy even going to be able to put on skates in two weeks? You know, kind of thing. Um, but uh, he got right. Uh, we were, you know, did the, did our, uh, did our homework on figure skating Reddit. There were like, fans in Pyeongchang who were at the practice and they were like yep Han Han Hanzu uh he attempted three quads he landed all three and we're like okay so he's in good form he's fine and we got got down a pretty good amount on uh on him in Pyeongchang and Han Yu and he was uh he was outstanding um the funny part is after his performance was over he has an enormous contingent of fans worldwide they all travel to see him skate and they all throw winnie the pooh bears on the ice after his, his skate is <laughs> over it was absolutely surreal like what is happening this is wild. uh and so that was a very memorable moment moment from 2018 getting those uh, gold medal tickets home and uh you know i followed skating pretty you know pretty decently through the qualifying and i flipped open some markets and ha and hanyu was eight to one to win gold and i was like the hell i was like how <laughs> they're gonna give us eight to one on this like this can't be right and so i yeah. start to do a little homework do a little digging and you know the minus 1200 uh american nathan chen uh and yes you know, at at first you know first whip it's like that's not fair price like there's right. no way he's that certain to win this 
Um, yeah. You start digging low. It's like, yeah, he's won every world since the last Olympics. It's like, yeah, okay, that's that's fine. Okay. Uh, you know, he's he's you know he's he's a world champion, no 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 doubt. Um, he choked last Olympics. Like the like the moment was way too big for him. He had a very poor performance uh, in 2018. And uh, and realistically, Han Yu is the only man in the entire program who is going to attempt a quad axle. That is four and a half spins. It is it is the most difficult jump in figure skating, and no one else is even attempting it. And he has he has not only been the only man to attempt it in competition, but has landed it, although did not land it cleanly in qualifying, uh, and got some deductions. That said, his qualifying score and the way it was rated uh in um uh you know in in the in the you know asian qualifying circuit would have been enough to win worlds every single time chen won worlds so basically you know can you just is kind of taking the intermediate time off not doing his best stuff in competition he's preparing for this his final olympic run and so i have a lot of eight to one down to about five to one at a number of different places um, I think he's in like the plus three thirty, plus three fifty range now, which is yeah, still. I'm seeing I think a plus two eighty right now. Okay, 70? so it's still getting it. It's, <laughs> there's still people hitting it. Um, yeah, I think that I think it's I think it's fifty fifty. I really do. If he lands, okay. if he lands the quad in competition, yeah. it is yeah. game over. Like it, it, it's a yeah. high enough scoring jump that even attempting it is going to give him the leg up over Chen. Uh, and it, again, if he lands it game over he wins um and honestly this is weird to say it in the back of my head i was almost like the chinese uh prime minister really does not, he's not a winnie the pooh fan like really not a winnie the pooh fan i don't know if you guys know the geopolitical aspects of you know of uh <laughs> jinping and uh the no, i was busy pooh. studying the curling yeah. uh, political, <laughs> yes. political uh, he gets he he gets compared to winnie the pooh quite a lot uh, just oh, in terms okay. of his, you know, his appearance and his disposition. Um, there's a lot of political cartoons where it's his head and Winnie the Pooh's body. And uh, <laughs> I think I've seen that was, on John Oliver. Yeah, and I was, I was literally in the back of my head, like, man, I really hope that they don't, um, you know, specifically monkey with this to make sure he doesn't win to prevent the Pooh getting thrown on <laughs> the ice thing. Like that would be really, uh, but that's not going to happen. They are not allowing uh, fans, particularly foreign fans. Uh, so there, there will only be, um, you know, kind of Chinese you know, handpicked audience here for this. And so I don't think we're going to get the Winnie the Pooh uh, throwing it on the ice, even if he does win. So we don't have to worry about that one uh, kind of leak there. Um, we just need him to hit a quad. And uh, and that, that would make my Olympics if he wins gold. Well, that's a first step to a good Olympics. There's no poo on the ice. <laughs> no so. poo on the ice. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's right. Clutch curling shots, Winnie that's the right. Pooh, and poo on the ice. I feel like this is a, an appropriate place to end. But guys, this, this was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, I learned so much in terms of angles that I need to be hitting as we get into the Winter Olympics. You can find Drew at whale underscore capper on Twitter and obviously NBC being a host network for the Olympics. I imagine your daily pod will be talking about this maybe a little bit over the next couple of weeks, but thanks so much for hanging with us, Drew. Really appreciate oh, it. Of course. Thank you for having me. Enjoy the games. And Matt, as always, you can find Matt at M Russ authentic is where you can find our guy, Mr. Matt Russell. Thank you for doing this as well. And you know, I'm, going to try to get you on you know there's this event in football um oh. i think it's super something coming up maybe we'll talk about that somewhere down the line yeah i think i can i'll have to research it as soon as i'm done all my curling the last you know bits of curling one last thing drew i got one for you here my favorite bet of the entire olympics yeah winning margin betting in skiing Wow. If you can find a prop, like different places offer this, winning margin betting is electric. It doesn't matter who wins. You watch the entire thing and you are just sweating the clock at the end every single time. I don't even care which little window you take, right? 0.01 to 0.15, whichever window you take, you are always alive and you are never out of it. And it is absolutely the most fun you ever had in your entire life. No handicap worth, you know, necessary, necessarily. And you just go and you live it for a couple hours as skiers keep flying down the down the hill. Matt, you know me well. That is right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> I will definitely find those. <laughs>
and on Twitter at Shell Alexander. Don't forget to like and subscribe to DRF Sports Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also rate us, review us, like us, all that other fun stuff. But for more from this new project from DRF Sports, just a little reminder, if you're unfamiliar with the letters DRF, it stands for Daily Racing Forum which has been around for over 100 years, giving you all of the horse racing information, data, and analysis. But now, we've taken over the entire sports world. So if you want coverage on every football game, as well as the NBA, MLB, college sports, and more, head to drf.com sports for all of the details and insights, as the site has all of the data on every game, including offensive and defensive stats, betting angles, line movements, key injuries, team stats, and more. The DRF data is what powers our power trends. So if you want to see which trends our analysts have selected, follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want access to all of the raw data, drf.com slash sports. That's where you can find the usual previews as we deep dive into the games. Of course, got you covered on this podcast. However you want your betting information, we've got you covered. Again, my name is Sheldon Alexander. We do this podcast twice a week on Tuesdays and on Fridays. That's all I got for now. But until next time, see ya. Thanks for listening to the DRF Sports Podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. For more sports betting advice, go to drf.com backslash sports and follow on Twitter at drf underscore sports.